Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky, and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, the Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, this sacred place is, is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel, though Luz was the city's original name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is so high that i cannot attain to it where can i go then from your spirit where can i flee from your presence if I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you, the night is as bright as the day. Dark 
goodness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you, if you, live, your, if you live on the basis of selfishness, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will all live. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you were adopted as his children. With the spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we're also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs in, with Christ. If we really suffer with him so that, we, so that we can also be glorified with him. I believe that the present suffering is, not, is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. It was the choice of one who subjected it. But in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole generation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the it's not only the creation. We ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first crop of the harvest, also grown inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved by hope. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who planted good seed in his field. While people were sleeping, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and went away. When the stalk sprouted and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. The servants of the landowner came and said to him, Master, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Then how is it that it has weeds? An enemy has done this, he answered. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But the landowner said, No, because if you gather the weeds, you'll pull up the wheat along with them. Let both grow side by side until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll say to the harvesters, First, gather the weeds and tie them together in bundles to be burned, but bring the wheat into my barn. Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The one who plants the good seed is the human one. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the followers of the kingdom, but the weeds are the followers of the evil one. The enemy who planted them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the present age, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as people gather weeds and burn them in the fire, so it will be at the end of the present age. The human one will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that cause people to fall away and all people who sin. He will throw them into a burning furnace. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Those who have ears should hear. 
the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I have a theory that whenever Episcopalians hear scripture passages about things burning, we get very, very nervous. Which is why I tried very hard to preach a sermon today on the Old Testament, but the Holy Spirit had a different idea in mind. And this was further reiterated to me this week when I had two different conversations about our inability, or it seems like our increasing inability to hold complex space, to hold two contradictory or incongruous things together and allow for both of them to be true. And in this gospel story, we have two seemingly opposite, or at least incongruous, or unlikely pieces of good news. The first is that evil is real and active in our world. And the second is that it is God and not us who is responsible for sorting things out. The first thing that evil is real and active, I think can be good news because we see evil and its effects all around us. We see pain, we see suffering, we see things that choke out and destroy the creatures of God. And Jesus gives us permission to name that. The servants ask the landowner, how did the weeds get there? And the landowner replies, an enemy has done this. Melissa Flora Bixler, who's a Mennonite pastor, says, I refuse to give reasons, explanations, or justifications for suffering. This is also scripture's approach. If Job teaches us nothing else, that is what Job teaches us. Suffering just is, I have said, she has said many times. It happens because we are people in the world, and the best we can do is to help each other through it, turning to one another and to God for support and care. And I don't know about you, but I find that deeply unsatisfying. <laughs> but it is our way, it is the way of the Anglican tradition in which we have found ourselves. And if you're not sure about that, I invite you to turn to our baptismal covenant, which is in the Book of Common Prayer, the black book in your pews, um, page 302. You don't have to, I'm going to read it to you. But page 302, I should have marked the page before I got up here, is our baptismal covenant, the set of promises that we make when we become baptized. The first question, first set of questions, are about evil. The first question is, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? And the answer is, I renounce them. The second question is, do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? And the answer is, I renounce them. The third question is, do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? And the answer is, I renounce them. Now, taking them in backwards order, I think this is how we have come to think about evil or badness or suffering in the world. First, we think it's our personal choices. There are Christians who believe all evil in the world comes from us making bad choices. The second, going backwards again, is systemic evil. Racism, capitalism, unchecked greed, those are the causes of suffering in the world. And there are some Christians who believe that's the only kind, the only source of evil in the world. But the third kind of evil, actually the first one we renounce, is this cosmic force of evil. So we have cosmic evil, systemic evil, and personal evil. And whatever name you put to that cosmic evil, whether it's the devil or ha Satan, where we get Satan, which just means the adversary, there is something that we don't quite fully understand, sowing destruction and badness in our world. Where this is good news, though, is we turn around. We renounce co cosmic evil, systemic evil, and personal evil, and then we turn right around and build backwards. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? I do. That's your personal choice. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you agree to operate on Jesus' systems of grace and love? And then thirdly, do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. That is the cosmic reorientation. That is saying, I am trusting to follow God. God is the God of my life, not myself. So we have three renunciations, and then we turn back and have three affirmations. 
And you might be thinking why I took us on that little detour, but because I think we have a tendency to see ourselves as the God of our own lives. The Landover says there is evil. An enemy has sown evil seeds in this field, and the servants say, let us fix it. Many of us want to be the landowner, the person responsible for getting rid of evil things. But God and the landover, landowner says no. Debbie Thomas, who's my favorite New Testament theologian, says no and wait. Jesus insists on patience, humility, and restraint when it comes to patrolling the borders of his precious field. He asks us, even as we acknowledge the pernicious reality of evil, to accept his timing instead of ours when it comes to destroying it. Why? Because he knows, as Barbara Brown Taylor says, the business of discernment is much harder than we think it is. Turn us loose with a machete, and there's no telling what we will chop down and what we will spare. There's no telling what we will chop down. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord is another way of saying, do you acknowledge that God is God and you are not? It's another way of saying, will you put down your machete? It's another way of saying, will you accept God as the chief actor in your life? Will you honor God's sometimes baffling and illogical and silly farming methods instead of your own? Because the field is the world, but it is also our heart. We are both saint and sinner all of the time. And Jesus knows that there is no way that we can police the wheat of the field without also damaging we, no way we can police the wheat field without also damaging the harvest. There's no way we can get rid of everything bad in ourselves without getting rid of everything good. When we rush ahead of God and start yanking out weeds left and right, we do terrible harm. Our sincerity devolves into arrogance. Our love devolves into judgment. Our holiness devolves into hypocrisy, and the field suffers. I know this feeling. Do you? I know there are times I'm like, I'm right, they are wrong, just let me fix it, and it will all be okay. But this is the yearning and the challenge and the gift and the call of the church, I think, in particular. I think is the church is one of these places where we can hold complex space, and our world is quickly losing the ability to do that. And why this matters is because our world is complicated and messy and contradictory, and we desperately need belief systems that acknowledge that. Because Christianity is nothing if not the ability to hold together bizarre, nonsensical, counterintuitive, and irreconcilable truths. Here's just a short list. God is one and God is three. Jesus is God and Jesus is human. The Bible is God's word and the Bible is authored by flawed humans. Creation is good and creation is broken. To give is to receive, to die is to live, to pardon is to be pardoned, to be weak is to be strong, to serve is to reign. We're saved by grace and faith without works is dead. We are in the world, but not of the world. The kingdom of God is coming and the kingdom of God is already here. You can't hold, you can't pick one or the other. That's what Christianity is all about, is living into this paradox. And I'm paraphrasing Debbie Thomas when she says, it is exactly these contradictions that give our faith heft and credibility. Because if we live in a world that is chock full of contradiction, then we need a religion that is robust enough and complex enough and sturdy enough to bear the weight of that broken world. I need a religion, she says, that empowers me in Richard War's words to live in exquisite, terrible humility before reality. Exquisite, terrible humility before reality. Because reality is full of ambiguity and contradiction. And that definitely upsets and unnerves us. It upsets and unnerves me because we wanna separate good and evil. We want things to be separated and neat and tidy in ways that we understand and we agree with. But the good news is that the God we worship and serve is too big for that, is too hardy for that, refuses to be flattened into a flimsy one dimensional set of rules you can apply in every single situation. And where does that leave us then? That God is God 
and we are not. And evil is real, but I can't fix it. And it's not my role to root it all out. We have to pay attention because God does not always want to handle things the way I want to, the way we want to. Like Jacob, we have to be willing to be surprised by God does what God does and when God decides to show up. And we have to acknowledge that there is evil and also recognize some restraint and humility when we see that and to dwell into that paradox. Debbie Thomas counsels us that our response is to move gently and with great care, recognizing that our task is to grow the good, not burn the bad. Our job is to bless the field, not curse it. Remember, the field is not ours, it is God's. And only God knows it intimately enough to harvest it. Only God knows it intimately enough to bring it and tend it safely. And it's not, she goes on to say, that we hold paradox. It's that paradox holds us. We are held in a deep place, an ample place, a place that is generous and sufficient and it is roomy and it has all the conditions we need for growth. And though we might fear paradox, God does not. And it is in God's soil that we are firmly planted. We are safe, my friends, and we are planted in God's field. And it is a deep and wide place where tender shoots get everything they need, even the shoots we may not like. God will show up. God will take care of the weeds, the evil, everything that chokes and poisons out the good. This is the, tr this is the trust we have, that God will make things right, and we do not have to. Everything that corrupts and destroys and chokes out and diminishes the beautiful light of God in all of God's creatures will eventually be consumed in all consuming love. That is the end where nothing evil remains. All is love and God is love. Amen.